It's Canada's worst wildfire season, on record. And a new report out says, climate change made these fires twice as likely, increasing the chances of extreme weather fire conditions in the future. In a world grappling with the impacts of global warming, some would say, largely driven by human activities, the question of whether the very corporations responsible for these environmental challenges should be entrusted with providing the solutions, becomes a deeply thought-provoking concern. Over the course of history, corporations have consistently wielded their influence over land and resources, often at the expense of individuals and communities. In 1845, Ireland's potato crop was devastated by an unknown disease. The resulting food shortage would spiral into a human rights disaster that lasted years and took the lives of over one million people. Fearing their homeland would never recover from what was being called the Great Hunger, millions of Irish immigrants fled to the United States. It forever changed both countries and the whole world. This historical pattern raises valid concerns about their motivations and intentions in tackling the crisis they have created. Throughout time, corporations have exerted their authority over land, leading to the displacement of people from their ancestral territories. So I am here in Argyll on a very brief day and the ruins that you see behind me are the remains of an old crafting settlement by the name of Arachonan. This is one of many all across the highlands where people once lived and worked. The principle of Duhas under the Highland clan system gave people the native right to rent and live on the land of their ancestors. For many, this meant living in crofting communities called townships. The language spoken was Scottish Gaelic, with kinship reigning at the heart of Gaelic culture. Days would be spent working on the croft, and evenings in gatherings of music, dance and storytelling. Life would have been simple and hard, but with a rich sense of home and community. When the clan chiefs began to see themselves more as landlords, however, things began to change. The eviction was carried out forcibly by the land officers of Lord Macdonald's estate, the milk basins being poured outside and the cottage wrecked so that the people could not return. She looked out into the darkness and saw a red glow opposite. She asked what it was and her mother said in a grim voice, They are putting fire to Mate. The people have been put out. Unfortunately, this trend continues with recent events like the natural Maui fires serving as opportunities for these entities to further expand their interests. This pattern harks back to the industrial era when corporations thrived by capitalizing on a labor force removed from the land and placed into factories, driving an economic model reliant on perpetual growth and consumption. The modern consumerist system constructed by corporations hinges on the production of goods designed for obsolescence. This approach drives incessant purchasing and exacerbates the strain on the environment. For over a century, governments and corporations have colluded to shape how you think. They socialize you, they hypnotize you into becoming a docile cog in a consumer machine. It's not an accident, this is all according to plan. It wasn't always this way. Stuart Ewan in his book, Captains of Consciousness, provides us with a history of advertising in the early part of the 20th century. He shows us how Americans from diverse walks of life were trained to desire mass-produced goods that, just a few years before, they didn't know they wanted. How did that happen? Let's look at Henry Ford. He had a goal that every one of its factory workers could buy a Ford automobile. Was this complete selflessness on his part? Hardly. He would not appeal, he decided, to the sort of person who had the most money, but to the greatest number of people who had money enough to buy a car at the lowest price 
for which a serviceable car could be manufactured and sold. Ford wasn't the only ones. America's been called a melting pot, but these ingredients could clash. So the powers that be decided to turn up the heat. If you want your product to appeal to the masses, you need a mass to appeal to. In order to do that, advertising appealed to our instincts. Fear, lust, and shame were triggered by these campaigns. To see how this was done and why it was effective, let's take a look at this deodorant ad. This poor woman is the subject of gossip. She's got stinky pits. She's behind the times. If you're a guy, you don't want to be with her, and if you're a woman, you definitely don't want to be her. Suddenly, you've got an itch. You've been made aware of a deficiency you didn't even know you had, and now you're a lifelong customer. Ewan writes, Immigrants would be Americanized, a process identical to the abolition of their common memories and the replacement of them by a mass perception keyed to the vaulted aspirations of mass-produced goods. President Calvin Coolidge was quite direct in describing the purpose of marketing. It was, in his words, a form of education. We are taught what to want and the market satisfies these appetites by producing products. He said, the uncivilized make little progress because they have few desires. The inhabitants of our country are stimulated to new wants in all directions. In order to satisfy their constantly increasing desires, they necessarily expand their productive power. They create more wealth because it is only by that method that they can satisfy their wants. It is this constantly enlarging circle that represents the increasing progress of civilization. The pursuit of profit has historically taken precedence over environmental well-being, worker rights, and sustainable practices. Consequently, entrusting these very corporations to rectify a crisis they've created, raises ethical questions about potential conflicts of interest and genuine commitment to meaningful change. So we're a family of five, and we live in a yurt. We've been living off-grid for 13 years. We've been homesteading for seven of those 13 years, and we'll continue growing and continue homesteading till the end of our days. A lot of people move so many times during their lifespan, but we found the spot, and we we're both into it 100%. It was really just wanting to live off the land, wanting to live quietly, wanting to have a peaceful life living outside and knowing that we were going to have a family, wanting to connect our children with that and raise our children in that was the biggest driving force. We do really have to watch the weather, but I think that's one of the most beautiful things about living off grid, especially when you require the sun for your power and rain for your water. So you're constantly living with the seasons and when you don't have control over it, you don't take it for granted. A vision of a time before environmental degradation took root paints a picture of a society where individuals lived in harmony with their land, cultivating self-sufficiency and resilience. This stands in stark contrast to the corporate-driven model that seeks to concentrate land ownership and centralize populations into highly controlled urban environments. The idea of 15-minute cities and leasing goods and services echoes a factory farm mentality, reminiscent of how battery hens are confined and managed. The essence of the issue lies in the fundamental misalignment between profit-driven corporate interests and the urgent need for holistic, sustainable solutions. Addressing global warming requires a comprehensive transformation, encompassing ethical considerations, innovative technologies, and equitable distribution of resources. The solution seems clear to anyone with a sensible perspective. Rather than preventing people from accessing the land, the plan should involve reintegrating them with the land. Individuals would receive parcels of land to cultivate, supported by the efficiencies made by the corporations over the years, which were normally funneled into the pockets of a few billionaires. This redistribution of wealth would aid in transforming the land into self-sustaining homesteads. If one disagrees with this approach, it can only be interpreted as a lack of genuine concern for both planetary well-being and humanity. 
this perception could lead to suspicions of alignment with a particular agenda, whether that of a self-proclaimed climate activist or not.